The view that reality is a set of multi-layer delusions has been presented in several previous contemplations on this and many other value channels. Physicality itself, for instance, as perhaps the basest of its layers, is clearly a foundational limitation imposed upon the essential free nature of spirit. Nonetheless, it is here as an integral part of the experience our consciousness faces. In my view, only worth as much as that, it is undeniable that nothing we find in this reality is truth and, consequently, not our true essences. However, the fact that it is not truth does not mean it is entirely devoid of purpose, nor that it does not reveal in an indirect manner a piece of a pointing arrow that sends us in a general direction towards that truth. The principle that can be inferred, first and foremost, is that if we agree that everything in existence stemmed via emanation or creation, directly or indirectly, from one source, that is itself necessarily uncreated, then we must also conclude that everything that is not truth, and that is even op oppositional to it, could only have come also from the potentials contained in that one source. If, on the other hand, we do not agree with one source as a single point of origin for all, that is, taking the Manichaeistic view, that postulates that there is not one source but two, consequently denying the omnipresence of God by presenting two separate origins, a God and a devil, one the origin of good and truth, the other of evil and delusion, we are left with the question of where did those two come from then? If these are, let's say, twins, one of light, one of darkness, then can two be uncreated? To be uncreated, that is, to be the everything and the nothing at the same time, it can only, consequently, be singular. The description of the one source contained in the Apocryphon of John puts that beautifully as follows. It does not exist within anything inferior to it, since everything exists within it alone. It is eternal, since it does not need anything, for it is absolutely complete. It has never lacked anything in order to be completed by it. So, if one source, absolutely complete, that lacks or needs nothing, that, as stated in the text, everything exists within it alone, is by inference the case, then, that all that is illusory also necessarily comes from it and is within it, because illusion, although not true, exists manifestedly. Therefore, with that presented as a foundation, if all that is illusory and false also exists both within and from that one source of truth, then it is an inescapable consequence that illusion plays a necessary role, one that is obviously absolutely debatable for sure, but that I will present here merely as my own observations, not to be taken as truth. Firstly, I would say that the Manichaeistic view is, for me, a simplified and more literal point of view of the twin nature of manifestation and creation. The Ophiuchus constellation representation shows this beautifully with the man holding the serpent. Are they wrestling? Are they dancing? Do they hate each other? Do they love each other? All of those at the same time, in my observation. But Manichaeism simplifies this by separating the two that are, in my view, inseparable. You see, in my view, division is the initial stage of creation. And with it, that is, with the manifestation of light, any object manifested as well will cast a shadow, consequently. If we see creation as a hall of mirrors, given its inherent and observable, at least in my view again, reflective nature, then we can also see that images with light 
object and shadow reflected on enclosing mirrors generate the previously mentioned mirror infinity effect, therefore reflecting that perceived duality to infinity, from larger to smaller. So viewed from that perspective, what is, in my opinion, the function of illusion? To me, it is to show to the one source all of its potentials, because if its nature is unmanifested, then only through manifestation can that be revealed. Then, a process of maturation occurs gradually through its many countless individual and limited points of manifestation, as each of us faces its own image in the mirrors of reality and at first figure out what we are and what we are not, but then, consequently, we integrate what we are not through transmutation of the shadow into light by reducing the size, so to speak, of the object or subject that casts it. When the original changes, all the images projected in the mirror infinity effect change as well, consequently. Once any part, big or small, of that is done, a new wisdom emerges that cannot be unseen. This is what I could name a process of maturation, because the fact that the one source is omnipresent and lacks nothing does not mean it knows everything about it. In myths from a much lower perspective, we see how Odin was depicted as hanging himself upside down, like the hanged man tarot card, to obtain the knowledge of the runes, or how he made a deal with Mimir to trade one of his eyes for a sip of the waters at the root of Yggdrasil, the world tree, to know more about the universe. And in that regard, I agree with the Manichaeists. God isn't omniscient, but a child that is growing up through us. Blasphemy, some of you will yell, perhaps. Yet, I have come to realize, which does not imply at all that it is true, that we here, as physical individualized manifestation of the one source, submerged in illusion, are the key factors for the one source of the true God. We are performing the most important of all services to it, by sifting through all that it itself can't do from its unmanifested, timeless position. In fact, it can't do anything directly, in my view. And another factor of the utmost importance that comes with it is the awakening in the individualized manifestations that we are, a spark of that absolute love that the one source is made of that love without judgment and with a comprehensive understanding of what that other is and why it is so, is the transmuting force that integrates the shadow by reducing the object that is in the way of the light. It is consequently the ultimate meaning, in my view, of the passage in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, from 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his sons to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This does not mean indiscriminately, in my view, because to be able to discriminate what is from what isn't is a key tool of consciousness but it means to perform that transmutation of the reflections through love. Those that hate you are, in fact, you hating and rejecting a part of yourself. 
And how often do we not fear love? Because it makes us vulnerable. Transmute the original individual manifestation of the one source, all limited and dirty, and all the images in the mirror change as well with it. Illusion can only reflect. <laughs>